before we get started, just a quick note, spoiler alert. And we are adults, and I will try very hard not to use adult language, but this is the warning. Hello, and welcome back to Last Library on the Left. My name is Jennifer. And I'm Sadina. We're a horror review and discussion podcast where we talk about horror in books, movies, and other formats, why we seek it out, and why we need it in our lives. Today, we're doing another twofer. From here on out, we're doing more than one. Yeah, and okay, guys, this is going to sound like such a weird reason, but (laughs) one of the reasons is because we like the way it looks better on our social media. have the two images next to each other but also let's be honest it makes it more interesting for comparative discussion yeah because i really like ending our episodes now with what's the commonality between both and why we need both of them (laughs) and doing it on shows that have multiple episodes multiple seasons is still something we'll do yeah that takes so much more consideration into time yeah and we have definitely gone off the rails for our timing. I mean, we really have. <laughs> and that's with edits, so. Yeah. Uh, you know. no, and that's with double edits. I edit <laughs> these things twice. <laughs> So we're going to make conscious effort to do better this time around. Yes. So today we're starting a Guillermo del Toro two episode. Yeah, run. Today we're covering the 2006 film Pan's Labyrinth and also the 2007 film The Orphanage. Mm -hmm. So Pan's Labyrinth was written and directed by Guillermo del Toro and it stars Ivana Baquero as Ophelia, Ariadna Gill as Carmen, Sergei Lopez as Captain Vidal, Maribel Verdu as, I think they say Mercedes in the movie, Alex Angulo as Dr. Ferrero, and my favorite Doug Jones as the (laughs) fawn and also the pale man, which just side note, if you don't know Doug Jones, which you probably don't. No, you do. That's the weird thing is that you know Doug Jones, but you don't know you know him. Yeah. So Doug Jones played the fawn. He also played the pale man in Pan's Labyrinth. But did you know (laughs) that he played the gentleman in an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer? He played Saru in Star Trek Discovery. He was the Silver Surfer in the Fantastic Four. He played the Baron in What We Do in the Shadows. He played Billy in Hocus Pocus. <laughs> he played Abe Sapien in Hellboy. And he played the Amphibian in The Shape of Water, among many other things. Yeah, <laughs> those are just the titular roles that you would definitely know you know him now. Yeah. <laughs> it's just insane. How does that man have that many roles under his belt and we don't all have his name in our zeitgeist? Right. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like that blows my mind. It was years ago and it was the most famous guy that you didn't know was famous. And it was a picture of Doug Jones and all the different characters he played. And I was just like, what? And yeah. I think he's like 60 years old now. Oh, whoa. He doesn't look that old, no. but he's been around a long time. <laughs> he's played lots of characters. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of the characters, Jennifer and I were talking about this in pre-production, but eventually we're going to do something on Buffy. But because Buffy ran for so long, mm-hmm. we're going to do choice episodes that really messed us up. Up yeah. Or got to us, and Hush is one of them. Yeah. So I'm glad to hear that he was in that episode because we'll be talking about him again. You know, it has a very similar perseverance reaction as an audience yeah. member as The Quiet Place. See, and I haven't watched The Quiet Place oh, yet. Girl, we're gonna have to watch The Quiet Place. Me and M saw that in theater, yeah. and we got out of the theater and we felt so lightheaded, like we were drunk mm-hmm. because yeah. we'd had a constant adrenaline rush throughout the entire movie and didn't notice until the adrenaline stopped and we were like got a blackout. I've heard so many things. I guess I just, I don't want to say I'm scared to watch it, but I've just been waiting for the moment to watch it, right? When we cover it, which (laughs) we eventually will. Oh, and there's a sequel, so that will be our two first. There we go. (laughs) It's a natural two. And I'll text you the whole way through. (laughs) Okay, back to Pan's Labyrinth. Before we get into the actual movie or anything, I just want to stand for a minute about the music. The music is by Javier Navarrete, and I'm really sorry for butchering the names. I'm doing the best that I can. (laughs) (laughs) But the music from Pan's Labyrinth was haunting. It was... That felt like a fairy tale. Yeah, very fairy tale-ish. I know that he said that he was going for a lullaby feel. Mm -hmm. Completely get it. Just, I love it. It's one of the very few soundtracks that I have on a playlist. I really enjoyed it. So Pan's Labyrinth, we open up to it and we find out that there's this princess. Her name is Moana. Much like the Disney princess Moana. Yeah, I know. That's funny. Every time they said Moana, I was like, okay, like the only difference is that there's two ends. Yeah. (laughs) Princess Moana, she's a princess of the underworld and she went to visit the human world 
world and loved it so much that she ended up becoming mortal and she died in the mortal world. And her dad... Well, it said that Princess Moana escaped. Oh, but because, she escaped. Yeah, because she was meant to stay in the underworld. She escaped, but the sun blinded her because she had never been in the sun before. Mm-hmm. And then she had amnesia. And which, her... like, same. When I go out into the sun, that should be bright, y'all. I... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I have very light eyes. My daughter is the same. She's like, the sun is trying to kill me. I'm like, well, the sun is the reason we're alive, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I feel you over there. Yeah. <laughs> trying to kill me, too. Yeah. So Moana's dad builds labyrinths around the world in hope that one day she will return to the underworld. And we also get, which I'll let you talk about the Civil War aspect of it, but the main synopsis of the movie is in 1944 Spain, Ophelia and her mom Carmen, they are moving to live with Ophelia's stepdad, Captain Vidal. Captain Vidal is in charge of tracking and fighting the rebels. And Carmen, who is pregnant, is on bed rest and so Ophelia is she's very much on her own this whole movie and she finds this insect that leads her to a labyrinth and there she meets the fawn and the fawn tells her this story about a princess and saying that she could be the princess in order to find out if she is a princess to go back to the underworld to be with her real family she has to complete three tasks the movie goes on from there and we'll talk about more summary stuff as we get into our analysis yeah. but I'll let you go ahead and cover the Civil War stuff because that was pretty interesting I'm, I can't wait <laughs> yeah. So, well, first, interestingly enough, the Spanish Civil War actually ended before 1944. Oh. There were probably still skirmishes and whatnot yeah. because of small uprisings, but mm-hmm. the leaders uprising mm-hmm. of the Spanish Civil War, there was a man named Emilia Mola y Vidal, who was the second in command. So 1944 was technically World War II. Okay. Hey, James. The political inspiration for the Civil War was actually his idea, but he was not the first in command. Oh. And so the first in command was Francisco Franco. Now, Vidal dies in a plane crash, and there are rumors, even to this day, that his death and that the third in command, their deaths were orchestrated. Oh. By the first in command, because they weren't aligned with him. Oh. So because Emilio Mola y Vidal, he was so anti-communist, mm. he believed in very strict class separation without any leniency which we did see in the movie I think we did yeah we absolutely saw that Mm -hmm. but because he was so unforgiving about it that was not going to help unify Spain so he was a little problematic politically so he was theoretically taken Mm -hmm. out yeah wow yeah so I thought it was really interesting that Guillermo del Toro as a native of Spain Mm -hmm. chose to name the captain Vidal oh he did that on purpose yeah (laughs) And we will talk about his other historical purposeful. Yeah. Yeah. He, Guillermo del Toro is a very detail oriented man. Yeah. When it comes to his work. So as we go through this story, we have some other characters that we meet. We meet Mercedes, who is the housekeeper, but you find out she also works with the rebels. We meet Dr. Ferrero, who's caring for Carmen. But again, I thought his name was Ferrario. Maybe Ferrario? Maybe I just want a Ferrero Rocher. Because I keep saying Ferrero. Yeah. Yeah, I have E-I-R-O. Dr. Ferrario. So he's caring for Carmen. And he's also, I don't want to say he's chosen a side, but he seems like he's more compassionate to everybody. I suspect that he was in love with... Mercedes. Oh. Because because he was very compassionate with her. Anything she wanted, I think she could have asked for. Yeah. And there was a scene later in the movie when she was meeting with the rebels. Yeah. That he was chastising them for keeping her involved and keeping her in danger. Yeah. And he was like, if you would just let her run away and be free, it would be better for her. And he was like, think of the ones you love. And kind of looked at her and I was like, ooh, okay. Think about the ones you love. Huh? Oh. <laughs> So we also get Carmen, who her health is fading. She's like, I don't know that they ever explained it, but it her pregnancy. sounds like she's got HG. Oh, maybe you know? so. Because she's puking all the time. Yeah. Always and sick. I mean, that poor woman. Yeah. She's. <sighs> So I watched this through the eyes of a parent this time. And I completely get that she wants a father figure in her daughter's life. I completely get it because I definitely want that for my kid. Mm. But at the same time, I'm not willing to go through the expense of potentially putting a negative father figure in her life, right? It's of the utmost importance. Now, I understand back in those times, you were considered kind of an outcast for being a single woman, raising a child. And I understand that you're kind of cast aside you're not really considered a member of 
of the community. Especially in countries with that much machismo and their, yeah. you know, culture and their history. Yeah. So for her, it was, he's your father and you call him dad. And, and then she you said, know. call him father. It's just a word. I was like, ooh, that sounds gross. Yeah. And it was interesting just watching it and dealing with my own emotions and feelings of wanting that father figure in my daughter's life. But oh, hell no, not someone like Vidal. That's yeah. the reason why I haven't like actually tried, you right. know. At what cost? Yeah. Because at what cost was it? And then I understand that she was pregnant too. I get her emotional take on it. I struggled in my notes trying to pinpoint what tipped her over into yeah. this is worth keeping in our lives despite how kind of terrible Vidal clearly is. Yeah. Because he very clearly, I mean, he even tells the doctor, if it comes down to it, let Carmen die and save my son. Man, <sighs> Let me tell you, when I watched that scene, I was like, this... There were a lot of curse words that came out of my <laughs> mouth. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> the doctor, too, because, of course, this is before sonograms. Yeah. The doctor was like, how do you know it's a boy? Yeah. And, man, Vidal, it wasn't even one of those things where he kind of was like, oh, it's father's intuition. or blah. Yeah. He just looked at him with a stare, like, I will slit your throat. Don't joke with me. I was like, damn, that's, that's really scary. That's mm-hmm. very toxic. Yeah, he was a real toxic yeah. man. Because it sounded like if it turned out to be a girl if it was born a female that he would have completely left Carmen and her family in the dust. Oh I have no doubt that he would have. Speaking of Vidal I wrote down that obviously he doesn't care for Ophelia or Carmen. He really doesn't. I wish that I could have seen how those two got together because I would have loved to have known what transpired there. I don't was it an arrangement that they made? Maybe because it the way she described it at the dinner party because someone was like how did you two meet? Mm -hmm. She was like after my husband passed I worked at his tailor shop to support yeah. us and Captain Vidal had been coming in for so long that's how we met and I was just like that's not I mean yeah. that's not a reason to fall in love and then she tried explaining to Ophelia you don't understand you're not a grown up sometimes you just yeah. have to like, find a way to be happy and I was like this is all terrible I hate it all <laughs> And doesn't seem like she's happy. No. Carmen seems like she's settling just to have yeah. someone to provide. I mean, like, that makes... Like you were, like, running the tailor shop. You were providing just fine. Yeah. That makes sense, though, because I remember when she had the dress for Ophelia. Mm. She was like, oh, such a nice dress. I would have loved to have this kinds of dresses when I was younger. Maybe. Maybe, maybe it was the... The desire to the des- provide. Yeah. Number. Right. And the respect that came with being with a high-ranking officer. Okay, y'all. <laughs> Life ain't worth that. No. <laughs> Don't trade dignity and autonomy for for status. Yeah. If you're just going to be unhappy, that's miserable. That's yeah. so stupid. So stupid. Also, you're not doing your child a favor. No, definitely not with Vidal at no. all. Ugh, God, I just hated him. He's um, pretty gross. I noticed that he's very paranoid too, which is rightful because he makes Mercedes drink the coffee and he's like, mm-hmm. it doesn't taste good. But I know it's because he thought it was poisoned. I did not catch on to that. I, I did. He was just being a picky prick. No, the way he watched her, I was like, I was like, oh, he thinks it's poisoned and she drank it and he was like it doesn't taste good and then they complained that it was burnt coffee first off y'all I love burnt coffee yeah Yeah, that, I did not catch on to that. Oh. I caught on to it. And then afterwards, when he was like with the vial, with the doctor, I was like, oh yeah, he knows there's a traitor in there somewhere. And because yeah. he's constantly fighting the rebels, he should know that it would be dumb of him to assume that everyone in his camp was loyal. Yeah. Right? Well, especially um, the way he treats them. Yeah. He's aware um, that he's cruel. He's very aware. I also kind of picked up on some self-loathing on his part. Yes. Yes. Um, like, oh, he, mm, the thing about his dad and the watch, because somebody at the dinner party told the story of, oh, I knew your dad before he died and mm-hmm. he was a great man. And I heard a rumor that he smashed his watch before it was given to you so that you would know the hour he died and how real men die mm-hmm. in battle. He was like, that's stupid. My father never owned a watch. Yeah. And you see him with the watch like all the, all the time. Like, and he repaired it. Yeah. All the time. When he was shaving and he took the blade to his reflection in the mirror and pretended mm-hmm. to sleep his own throat. I was like, bro, you need therapy. <laughs> you know what I, I wrote down? I thought that maybe Captain Vidal as someone who is very clearly living in a lap of luxury, yeah, has a lot of resentment towards actual fighters and maybe even the guerrilla fighters and yeah. the mountain because they're actually fighting for what they believe in, whereas he is benefiting from the war and he wants to rule but not fight for the right of it. And yeah, I was like, he just does not like himself. No, he does. He very clearly 
clearly doesn't like him so I'm like but he wants people to think he's a fighter and a leader yeah and he commands respect when really no one should respect him I think I wrote down gross toxic male machismo energy yeah <laughs> it's like the epitome of it gross <laughs> He's just disgusting. Blech. I also wanted to talk about, I noticed that this movie had some parallels to Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. And I told you before that I noticed it. I think the orphanage has parallels to Peter Pan. They even mentioned Peter Pan in the movie. Mm -hmm. And the shape of water is very clearly the Little Mermaid. So Guillermo del Toro, I think, is taking these fairy tales and turning them on their side, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you think about it, when Ophelia first meets the wood insect that turns into a fairy, it leaves leads her to the labyrinth, much like the white rabbit, right? Mm -hmm. Leads her down the hole. And then her dress is very similar to the animated it Alice really in Wonderland. Is. Yeah. And then like in Alice in Wonderland, she wakes up and it's all a dream, right? And with Ophelia, her human form dies. Because that then, was the dream. Right. So I was like, this is very much an Alice in Wonderland movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it really was. Um, Except that I still don't know if the fawn was good or bad. I don't think he was good. But he was, because in the end... But mm -hmm. was that just her dying imagination of how it played out at the end? I don't know. <laughs> I just thought she returned to the underworld. I mean, I could see that where it could be her imagination because the queen was her mother. Yeah, the queen was very clearly her mother, but the mother yeah. was also holding a, a baby. baby. Yeah. And her brother had not died. No. So there would be no reason for the baby to be there. But right. also the fae that had died mm -hmm. by the pale man were alive again. Right, they came back. Were yeah. resurrected. And I felt like that could have been her guilt mm -hmm. for not following the rules playing out in her death throw. It could be. I mean, I think it's definitely open to the viewer's interpretation because I didn't think of it that way. I just thought that they tried to make the fawn unreliable. He was your unreliable character. The other thing that I was convinced that it was her imagination was because all of a sudden her mom was... Oh, yeah! She was very, like, clearly European Madonna. Yeah. You know? And with the Christ child because of the baby. Right, yeah. And right, and she had the, the shining behind her, mm -hmm. the light shining behind her. And it felt very self-generated based on, like... It could be. Yeah. I mean, I really convince me <laughs> that's really interesting that it could have been her imagination maybe she wasn't the actual princess well and, and i don't know how true this is y'all because i'm not christian yeah but the thrones were very similar in height mm -hmm. like above everything and so tall to the thrones in the chronicles of narnia oh and i've heard that the chronicles of narnia is basically just christian fan fiction yeah and so i felt like the comparison to the thrones mm -hmm. was very similar mm -hmm. And I was wondering if that had something yeah. in the Christendom of her imagination, the way she projects her underworld. It could be, yeah. It really could be. Hmm. I like that. That's really interesting. Like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I really, I took it at face value. Like, oh, look, she's back in the underworld with daddy and mommy and her brother is there. <laughs> and look, the fawn's there and he's really good. <laughs> Everything seemed too drastic to me. And everything all of a sudden was very bright. Yeah. When they were first telling the story of the underworld. It was clearly very dark. So right, because like, when she went into the world and she saw the sunlight and whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. I'm pretty convinced that her last images mm -hmm. of the court of the underworld was actually her imagination and her death row justifying how she was dying and what had just happened. Right. It makes perfect sense, too, because, I mean, she's dying. And she's I a little girl who lived off fairy tales. Right. She loved fairy tales. What did her mom say? Like, life isn't a fairy tale or whatever. And for her, I guess, to end that way, you know, it is a fairy tale. Yeah, it felt like a good conclusion for her. Yeah, that's so funny because one of the tropes I wrote was good all along, the fawn. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm pretty convinced the fawn was not good. Yeah. And was never good. But like not evil. Just was not. Okay, there's a name for characters like that. Like the fae type that are not evil, but they're not actively working towards the good of humans humanity either. right well and i wonder now if the fawn if that last encounter with the fawn was a figment of her imagination mm -hmm. that's what i think it was yeah because at the end he says oh no your highness or whatever and i was like oh he's acknowledging that she's the princess but maybe because she's trapped because right before that she had lost all hope right mm -hmm. and mom had died and the rebels were coming and all hell was breaking loose at the house and clearly vidal was not going to keep her around forever no, he had made it very clear that he was going, now that Carmen was gone, he was going to kill her. Yeah, and she was going to be the first to die mm -hmm. if 
if anything happened. So maybe it was just her way of almost romanticizing her last moments mm-hmm. and trying to save her brother. That's what I think. Because the fawn seemed very ambivalent in mm-hmm. the beginning, but I grew very suspicious of him after Mercedes had said, my mother told me not to trust the fawn. Right, yeah. And then the exact next scene with the fawn mm-hmm. is her being a little suspicious of him. Yeah. And him trying to win her back over and mm-hmm. describing the obelisk with yeah. him and her and mm-hmm. a baby. And he was like, look, it's me and it's you. And she said, well, who's the baby? And he never answered. He never answered, yeah. He went back into, she has to do the three times or whatever. It makes sense. Even at the last scene when she's talking with the fawn and Vidal comes up, he doesn't see the fawn. Mm -hmm. He sees her talking and so, I mean, maybe it was a figment of her imagination. Which, in Alice in Wonderland, Wonderland was a figment of Alice's imagination. So I can see the parallels. I really liked it. That's a good interpretation. I think I'm convinced and I'm taking it. (laughs) And I'm going to tell my sister because my sister loves Pan's Labyrinth too. So like, (laughs) just ruin everything. Yeah. I'm gonna tell her. (laughs) So now that you ruined that trope for me. There's only other one trope that I found in this one that I actually wanted to discuss, which is humans are the real monsters. Mm. Because it's very true that the fairies, they kind of look kind of creepy, but the humans in the movie were the real ones. Yeah. Vidal and his crew, basically. Yeah. Because even like his second in command was disgusting yeah. in the way he was talking. You know, a lot of their interactions too, you can kind of, I feel like people could write off as soldiers doing their job until that dinner party. Mm-hmm. When they were clearly in overabundance of food and yeah. gorging their faces, but then discussing cutting rations to everyone right. else. And I was like, that's, that is disgusting. Yeah, that was another trope that I found was the do as you're told. Mm-hmm. And I mean... <sighs> We talk about it endlessly. Yeah. It's just the worst. Like, yeah. don't do it. But they very clearly enjoyed it. His crew. His um, privilege. So gross. Yeah. It was really disgusting. I wanted to also talk about... So, when I was doing some research, before we get into the Pale Man, because I want to save the Pale Man for last, I saw something online that there's a theory that Ophelia might be a changeling. Oh. Because they... the very beginning? Yeah. Because they focus on the fact that she's left-handed, which I didn't know yeah. that was a characteristic of a changeling yeah and I was just like that's really interesting and I wish that that was explored more I didn't did not realize that I mean and now I want to watch it again yeah and look for other clues I'm going to tell you why I got to this little thing. So last night, before we re-record, I try to watch again, just so it's fresh in my mind. And so I was watching it last night, and I saw in the pale man's room, there was, as you're getting introduced to the pale man, and you're seeing all this scenery, in the corner, there's a pile of shoes there. And I told Sadina, like, it really messed me up. I immediately brought to mind the piles of shoes that were from the kids in the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And so I was just filled with disgust. Mm Mm-hmm. I couldn't sleep last night because I just kept thinking about these piles of shoes. So when I was looking at it and looking it up online, that's when I saw the changeling thing. And so now I need to go back and rewatch it and see about the changeling because that's a really interesting take on it. It is because it also plays into the role of the little fey creatures that were the bugs first. Yeah. Because the fey creatures are the ones who drop off the changeling and take the baby. And to me, it seemed like the fawn was after the baby the whole time because they also seemed invested in keeping the baby be alive yep because he was the one who told her put the mandrake root under the bed and it would take on you know the baby's role the book that was giving her all of her tasks yeah instead of showing her the second task it, it showed, showed her, her the uterus yeah yeah it showed that the baby was at risk yeah so maybe it was a whole changeling thing the whole time whoa i know right like i need to go back and watch it with just the changeling in mind whoa. because such a mind blow yeah <laughs> You know, I wanted him to look more into the story of the toad at the bottom of the tree that was yeah. drawing it out because I vaguely remember some folklore somewhere in Europe about a toad that lives in the roots of a tree and mm-hmm. it corrupts the tree. Oh. I didn't, because I wasn't talking about this movie, I didn't look further into that. Yeah. But yeah, something about the toad being gluttonous. You know, there were a lot of issues of gluttony in this movie. Yeah, because I think right after the scene with the toad, they go into the dinner party. 
party. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because she's missing the dinner yeah. party. Yeah. Well, and the pale man, too. Mm-hmm. The pale man looked very familiar to me artistically. Yeah. And his body type is very much inspired by Saturn devouring his son. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Cannibalism. Also, the skinwalker type that you become yeah. when you do cannibalism. Kronos, the god who ate his children. Gluttony. Famine horseman. Mm-hmm. His body was inspired to look like a fat man who had lost a lot of weight rapidly. Oh, yeah. So he's always hungry. Yeah. So famine, things like that. Uh, but also the eyeballs in the hands is sort of a reference to a Japanese yokai tenome, which is a man that has the eyeballs in his hands and uses them up like, like that, like the pale man did. You know, when I think I first saw this, I didn't realize the little things, the holes in the middle of his face were nostrils. I thought that that was where the eyeballs came out. Yeah. <laughs> Same. So when he's there, I was like, oh, well, he's ugly. And then <laughs> when she starts eating the grape, like, obviously, I was like, girl, you know, you're not supposed to be eating this. And then when he put the hand, when the eyes open, I was like, okay, that's weird that the eyes are on the table. How is he going to see? And then I was like, well, maybe this is the Nickelodeon cartoon, Our Real Monsters, mm-hmm. where the guy's holding his eyes, right? And I was like, well, maybe he's going to hold them. And then when he put them in his house, I was like, oh, that's just nasty. <laughs> <laughs> he gave me nightmares when I first watched it while it wasn't really scary for me in horror the watching it the second time it was scary for me watching it as a parent yeah something i found interesting about him that i found scary that i don't know if it was intentional because i was very fixated on the gluttonous famine part yeah of him, but he doesn't speak it's like recordings of pigs ravenous pigs yeah there's like big hog types that are eating sloppily and hungrily and angrily oh. it sounded very hannibal lecter it was so very gross. creepy when you tell me the pig noise I was like ah yeah. <laughs> kind of grossed me out. One of the things that I took from it was, so like I said, I watched this as a parent, so it was very emotional, was the thought of a child encountering a scary adult. Mm. Because he was very much a scary adult. And just the fear that she felt when she finally saw him and she's running and she's trying to get away from him. And I was so scared for her. I knew she got away, but just thinking of it as a parent and thinking of my own child, I hope she never gets into something like that. I hope I'm around to help protect her or whatever, but so scary. <sighs> Yeah, I actually lost hope in her being able to accomplish the rest of the tasks because I felt like once the Fae had been eaten by the Pale Man, the Fawn would find that unforgivable. And so I think that's informed my later theory about the ending. This movie was all about her choices Mm -hmm. and when she chose to be disobedient because she was disobedient so many times, right? I wrote a note that at one point she actively got caught upsetting Captain Vidal. Yeah. And her mom was like, not having you only upset me but you upset the captain or right. your father and she got this cute little smile on her face yeah. like yes that's right she was just she moved the plot along based on her choices the movie was kind of black and white in terms of good versus evil yeah. and she kind of blurred the lines a little bit almost I think she just didn't know who to trust yeah and she was on her own for so long and she couldn't really go to her mom because mom was sick speaking of her mom being sick I don't think I thought about this the first time because I didn't have the medical knowledge mm-hmm. or medical history behind this but I think what the doctor Ferrerio was giving her mom to help her sleep was either nightshade or belladonna oh because he was like two drops only yeah and it put her to sleep right away yeah and that was an old trick was to use nightshade or belladonna oh. to make people sleep better oh and that's why she used it to drug the captain yeah oh i see that but i also felt like it was foreshadowing a lot of death yeah this was very much anyone can die at any moment movie which is kind of scary so i'm looking up the toad and i couldn't find any folklore but what i did find is that it's parallels so one of the websites that i really have gotten into liking is uh, schmoop.com <laughs> <laughs> and so this is what they say they said the toad is siphoning the life of the fig tree much like the spanish upper class is killing the lower oh. class by hoarding the resources oh wow they say it also could be representative of ophelia's baby brother Mm. because if you look at the fig tree it it does look like like a a uterus uterus. yeah as if that wasn't morbid enough (laughs) think of the toad's death and as it regurgitates a large sack that could be reminiscent of the afterbirth which is true yeah so (gasps) and the golden key is in there yeah to opening up the labyrinth yeah is a blood sacrifice that website was really good i just kept going back to that website it was just really informative so yeah 
<laughs> the toad was just more than a toad. <laughs> yeah. But I think Guillermo del Toro, he uses a lot of things to help the story along if you can pick it out. Yeah, like when her mother was first sick and took the nightshader belladonna mm-hmm. tincture, she was like, your brother is misbehaving, tell him a story. Yeah. So she tells him a story about a rose that gives immortality, but is yeah. growing out of a craggy rock that no one can reach and is yeah. surrounded by poison thorns. That's like, dang, that is really foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah. So you got the foreshadowing and in my head I was thinking Tupac the rose that grew from concrete. Oh. I was like, oh. I don't know why my brain went there. Like, just pop culture, Jennifer. Because <laughs> he talks about himself being yeah. like the rose, right? So that's what I immediately thought of. And I was like, well, look at that. <laughs> huh. no, I totally thought she was foreshadowing her own death. This pursuit for There's so immortality. Much mm-hmm. Yeah, that would eventually poison her. Which it did. This movie had a lot of layers. And it prepped me very well for the orphanage. <laughs> yes, which is definitely a good time. So I will go ahead and talk about The Orphanage, or El Orfanato, released in 2007. Directed by J.A. Bayona. Written by Sergio G. Sanchez. And produced produced by Guillermo del Toro and it stars uh, I'm gonna get this wrong because I just can't figure out how to mm-hmm. y'all I'm terrible with accents like accent <laughs> marks that should tell you how to pronounce something yeah I don't know why I never learned how to pick up on those Belen Rueda as Laura Fernando Cayo as Carlos Roher Princep as Simon Montserrat Caruya as Benigna Escobeda, Haroldine Chaplin as Aurora, and Mabel Rivera as Pilar. So the premise of the movie actually jumps right into they've already moved into the orphanage that she grew up in. Well, she didn't grow up in an orphanage. Mm. She was fairly young when she was adopted, but she has decided to come back to the building and renovate it and turn it into a home for the sick, for Mm -hmm. sick kids or kids Mm -hmm. with special needs. And she has also adopted a child. She has adopted a child with special medical needs. He is HIV positive. Carlos, her husband, is a doctor, so he helps administer his medication for being HIV positive. Simone does not know that he is adopted. So they're in this really nice, I mean, it's a very nice home. Yeah. And they're renovating it. It has so many good intentions. Mm -hmm. And Laura takes Simone to the beach. She knows everything about this place. This is where she grew up. And they go to a cave that is only accessible during low tide. Mm -hmm. And while they're in the cave, Simone is talking to someone that is not there, but he has a history of imaginary friends uh. so it doesn't strike her as a red flag right off mm-hmm. the bat I think until the seashells wind up at their front door because he leaves a trail of seashells from the cave to their front door and she's like well what are you doing and he was like well I'm leaving a trail for my new friend to come find the new home so he can come play <laughs> bad call yeah uh, I mean not really though because Tomas was like not really my friend right yeah. I mean we we didn't know that until the right. end so <laughs> I think when she sees the shell she knows something is not right because Simone had not left all the shells there. I think she began to become suspicious of maybe a predator instead. I think so. Which is a very valid thing to assume. Yeah. I mean, that's where I would go first. Mm-hmm. Me I would, too. Yeah, I would go to, there is this unsafe grown-up somewhere. Especially after Benigna coming onto the premises and trying to expose the secrets of his adoption and being HIV positive. Mm-hmm. And then going into the little shack on the property. Yeah. And she just, she was not a good woman. The haunting comes almost immediately. Simone disappears during Mm -hmm. a party that is sort of like an interview party, I guess, because she's showing off the house that the series to families with special needs kids. It's almost like an open house almost. Right. To be like, this is the home your children could stay in. Yeah. If you felt it was something you needed or wanted. Yeah. um, This is what we could provide. Because they had access to the house, full access to the house. And all the kids wore masks. And so I was like, okay, this is not like a birthday party. And I thought immediately open house sort of situation. Which was actually really smart. Yeah. Before the open house, though, Simon has told her that his new friends have a very specific game they like to play. Mm -hmm. And they take something of yours and leave clues on where to find it. Mm -hmm. Say that somebody stole one of those trinkets up there on the shelf of mine. And one day I walked by and noticed that there was something new there. And I would go to the place where that new thing used to be. And there would be yet another clue there. Go to the next place and so on and so on. And you eventually find 
where your treasure was taken. Right. Well, Simone goes missing during the open house Mm -hmm. and she discovers something in the wrong place. And initially I thought that Simone was going Mm -hmm. to be found somewhere, alive or not. That he had been taken somewhere, but because she didn't follow the clues, even though he had taught her the game. Yeah. That it would be her fault because she wasn't playing the game properly. Right. Yeah. I didn't pick up on that. Yeah. For a long time, after I watched the movie the first time, I remember thinking when she finds him, she's going to be devastated because the clues yeah. should have led her to where he was the whole time. Right, yeah. And that was sort of true, mm-hmm. but there were other reasons for why he passed away, which were all very sad. So after six months, she finally starts to sort of pick up on the clues again for whatever reason. Yeah. I think she's gotten to desperation, right? And she's yeah. looking for any way to try to find him. And no one believes her. Her husband doesn't believe her. The police don't really believe her. So I think it's just desperation has kicked in and she really wants to find him. Well, they found Beninga. Yeah. And she has been hit by a car and is dead now. So any clue that she thought would have, I guess, more naturally led to her finding her son yeah. is now dead and gone, which is unfortunate because that would not have been the first clue anyway. I, I mean, true. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so... She convinces her husband, Mm -hmm. give me two days here alone and I will be done. I'll let it go and we can move on. Because the husband is like staying at this house is not good for you. Right. We haven't taken in any kids. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a money pit and a depression sinkhole at this point. Yeah. So he's trying to make the logical jump to let's get out of here. Very much a doctor stance. (laughs) Yes. And she's like, just give me two days. And she comes to that conclusion that she just needs two days because she has invited a psychic Mm. to come and try to find their son. Yeah. Or maybe communicate with his imaginary friend. Yeah. You don't know which one. I think she still thinks somehow after six months he's still alive. I think so too. I think she, I would want to think that my kid was still alive, right? You hold out hope until you yeah. see their body that they're still alive. I understand that from an abstract point of view. Yeah. But <laughs> I almost said from a logical <laughs> point of view, if Ghost had taken him, yeah. which is like so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> to our logic yeah, to my logic <laughs> if I thought ghosts had taken my kid to play a game yeah but weren't gonna give him back until I followed the rules yeah then I would be like well he's dead because ghosts can't feed him right or he's not being held in the pantry or I don't know I get that she thinks that he might still be alive but I know in my head that he needs medicine right yes and so in my head he's deteriorating and the longer it takes for her to find him the worse she's gonna find him I wasn't thinking that he was alive but I was giving her the hope that she so desperately wanted. You know, and I think that Laura was convinced that they were ghosts to begin with Mm -hmm. because of the way that he spoke about his new friends. He was saying, I have six new friends. They can't grow up instead of they won't grow up. Right. When Laura lived in the orphanage before, there were six kids. Mm -hmm. There was her and five others. Yeah. And there was also a hidden one, Tomas. And all of the children died very shortly after Mm -hmm. Laura left and was adopted. And it was because the kids who loved playing games because they're children, Tomas had a physical deformity and always wore, for whatever (laughs) reason, he wore a burlap sack over his face or whatever. So he had a physical deformity and the kids, being kids and kind of cruel, they all went to the cave with him and took his mask and ran and were trying to convince him to leave the cave without the mask. But I think because his own mother had convinced him that he was a monster, that he wouldn't leave and high tide killed him. So he drowned in the cave. That unhinged his mom and she murdered all the children children yep. in retribution which another thing I thought was weird it was one of the massive plot holes that bugged me was that if they had bought the home she never shows any signs that she knows all of her friends disappeared how come that little ass village is not talking about all these kids I know I kind of wondered that too because when it came that all those kids were killed I was like but why didn't anyone like tell her something when they bought the house right. disclose it which I understand there's disclosure laws sometimes you don't have to disclose that but why was it that no one warned her even when she was out in the t- town or even when she had the open house or why didn't the cop bring that up when a child is missing that other children had gone missing on that property right and why was it that Benigna wasn't their first guess as to who they need to look into right because it wasn't until Lara brought her up that they looked at her I don't know so that was something that really bugged me that it was this massive a plot hole that we figured out let's put it that way plot hole but I felt like specifically the cops dropped the ball yeah because missing children orphans are not a problem and a woman woman who has the medical history and records of a strange child Mm -hmm. and is then on the property after dark that's a major red flag and that didn't ping anything for the police department no and then they didn't go oh you know what she used to work here (laughs) and these five other kids went missing yeah that was just so strange to me 
Pilar was not the most reliable as a detective anyway, so. So that really bugged me. Just fucking killing kids, y'all. That, I mean, good lord. Just so messed up. Anyway, so the psychic Aurora that Laura brings in Mm. goes through this trance walkthrough of the house where time is, like, not a thing. And so she's kind of experiencing the house on many layers. And she winds up finding the room where the kids all slept during Mm -hmm. the orphanage times. She hears them crying and wailing. Someone's hurt us. You know, we're dying. Help us. And she opens up the door and she sees something that is very clearly upsetting. Yeah. Very grotesque. I can only imagine that because Beninga poisoned them. Yeah. They are in the throes of vomiting and diarrhea and everything that poisoning does to a small child's body. And she's seeing that in five. So she comes back and she reports what she saw and everybody heard Mm -hmm. the children you could hear them on the the recordings that the like kind of throw together ghost team (laughs) were listening and they did this for free so that they could also further their own research into the paranormal world which I thought was cool but still the cop the psychologist cop and the husband still didn't believe it nope he was like well they were alone in the house for an hour it's like that oh okay (laughs) like you watched the same footage we did right (laughs) (laughs) oh so weird so I think at that point Laura knew her childhood friends something terrible had happened to them. Yeah. She was going to reconnect with them. She was going to find her son. She knew they had taken him. So initially during the open house when Laura was looking for Simon and she was looking everywhere for him and she opened up that little closet under the stairs Yeah, and everything fell out and everybody kind of looked at her like, mm-hmm. you're a crazy lady. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, the stairwell is important. They would not have spent so much time focusing on that right. door if it wasn't important. And then they show later when she was trying to follow the clues mm-hmm. before she gave up that she she never looked at the closet. That was the only door she didn't check for the doorknob, which I was like, oh, why would that be the only door you I didn't know. check? Come on, man. <laughs> you very likely could have still found him alive because mm-hmm. it was just later that night. Ugh, okay. Anyway, so... It's so sad. I know. Okay, now her husband has left her alone in the house and yeah. she's taking the time to basically to set everything back up as if it were the orphanage and the old beds and the old curtains mm-hmm. and covers and everything and she's wearing the matron's outfit. Yeah! <laughs> and so she's trying to just recreate the atmosphere mm-hmm. to entice the kids to re-engage with her. She cooks the same food and everything. She goes really all out. And she's not really getting in response and she finally frustratingly yells, what do I need to do to get you to participate? And they want to play a game Mm -hmm. because that's what this whole thing has been yep this whole time these kids are just children they just want to play games and she plays the game that the very first time i saw this i almost didn't watch the rest of this movie because the knocking game scared the absolute crap out of me it was like the red light green light of one two three knock on the wall and when nothing was happening at first and then you see that first silhouette of the ghost child and i was like no oh i just got chills now i was like no i hate it just stop playing the game your kid's dead like give up yeah (laughs) Yeah, at that point, I w- my hands are in front of my eyes, and I was like, yeah. okay. <laughs> and then it wasn't just the one kid. No. All of them showed up. Yeah. And I was like, what? I hate all of this. Yeah. And then, and then it touched her. Yeah. And I was like, no. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't like it. And they all scattered. And, and then she actually gave chase, and I was like, I would not have been in the mindset to play a game right now. I would have gone out the front yeah. door, and, and I like, would have been done with that place. I was like, oh, I was right the whole time. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> You can have the house. Yeah. Burn it down, yeah. baby. I'm sorry that happened to you, but don't touch me. Yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. done at that moment. The, the minute they started getting closer, I was like, oh my God, this is not going to end well. I was like, I don't like this. I don't like this at all. No. And I think I was still convinced that it was going to be evil ass children too. Me too. They were so scary. Yeah. She runs after the kids and gets the clue right finally mm-hmm. and figures out that the doorknob that was in her, I think in her safe with his yeah. you know, medical records, she puts the doorknob into the little hidden door mm-hmm. in the stairwell and she thinks she finds him alive. Alive, and he was just down there waiting for her the whole time and yeah. she, he's like you know can we go and she's like yeah but tell your friends that we have to stop playing the game right so we can leave because they're scary she's like i'll open my eyes and they'll be gone mm-hmm. and she opens her eyes and i mean they're they, gone yeah they're gone <laughs> plus side uh, but on the downside she's back in reality yeah and her son is dead he's mm. been dead for six months because he did play that game where yeah. they were hiding the little objects and stuff around but he tried leaving and when she opened opened up the door under the stairwell during the open house and threw everything back in there. Right. It hit the door that he needed to use to escape. Yeah. And he fell down the stairs and died. Uh. And it was just... 
so tragic and she's so untethered and I remembered the psychic told her only you know how far you'll go as a mother Mm -hmm. and when she said that I was like oh she's gonna kill herself just to be with her son again which is what she did she went into the room with all the kids and sat down and started telling stories and they're like oh it's Laura Laura's back but Mm -hmm. all I could hear was like it's Wendy Wendy's back and yeah she's telling stories she's all grown up and she's back with the lost boys yeah and all they wanted to do was play games Mm -hmm. and they were never gonna grow up and it was just devastating I mean it was kind of a beautiful ending and that her maternal love Mm -hmm. went so far as to be with them and to stay and keep them yeah forever and I wrote my notes happy yeah (laughs) yeah it was pretty devastating yeah it was really devastating in my notes i wrote peter pan obvious obvious peter pan i wrote that the most common trope in this movie was a jump scare we Mm. had a couple of jump scares and of course the scary kids and the old lady like the image of the first few silhouetted children coming Mm -hmm. at her Mm -hmm. will haunt me forever yeah and it wasn't meant to be it It wasn't yeah it's not meant to be scary but it is scary it's never i'll never be okay yeah I also wrote down something that I didn't realize was important until I looked it up. So her husband gives Laura this medallion. He's like, it's my favorite thing, whatever. Yeah. So I looked it up and it's the St. Anthony medallion. And St. Anthony was a patron saint of lost things and he helped you recover things. So once he gave it to her, she found her son. Yeah. And remember, she let go of the medallion before she killed herself. And in the end, he picked it up. Because yeah. he was, I think he was selling the house at this point. He picked it up and then he's looking and he's smiling. And I think he found her her and so in my mind I was like I wonder if he's gonna like kill himself too so he can be with the family oh no see I just assumed that he like finally believed everything because like I'm sure that the cops when after two days they came back saw that she had killed herself was holding on to a six month dead child and found a room under the stairs and were able to piece that all together I mean the one time the cops were good at something in this movie (laughs) (laughs) so I I assumed that he had put the pieces together that she was always right see I assumed that he had seen her and I was like he's smiling so maybe he saw her and oh, Simone I together. See. Like, he found them, right? Yeah. And that was only after I looked at the fact that there was a patron saint of lost things and the, and the patron saint helped you, like, find things. So I was huh. like, maybe that's why. Oh, see, now that you said that, I think maybe he was smiling because he knew she had found him. And maybe they were happy yeah. or something. Oh, you got dark. <laughs> He's like, they're all gonna kill themselves. Yeah. He said, give it back to me when we find him. Oh. And so I was like, okay, maybe maybe this was her way of communicating to him somehow. Maybe he... I found him. Yeah. But they would have known that because they would have found their bodies. Inside. Right, yeah. yeah. Just the way he smiled when he picked it up, he saw them together happy or something. I don't know. But I was like, that medallion. I had to look it up. Yeah, I didn't think about that. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> and so I wrote down for both of them, for both Pan's Labyrinth and the Orphanage, that, yeah, very bittersweet slash, quote, happy endings, question mark. The main characters were happy in their ending, even though though their ending was death and I was like sitting here thinking like okay why do we need these movies like what are these movies trying to like communicate to us we always feel like horror communicates something yeah. to us and I was like I think it's kind of communicating that death isn't the end death isn't the end but I absolutely feel that in El Orfanato it's a mother's love transcends everything because she persevered yes. through some stuff and I wrote that down perseverance because I think Ophelia too her life wasn't the best mm-hmm. and it was going downhill very fast and granted you know she died but I think she persevered very well for a little girl in that Mm -hmm. time and of course the mom too and yeah I think you're right a mother's love transcends and it's a strong love which I understand why women don't like men after they give birth because that love is that's otherworldly yeah as someone whose mom was I personally feel the epitome of maternal love yeah and acceptance and support that I felt very much that the orphanage was showing just to the extent a mother's love Mm -hmm. can reach and it will reach beyond the veil. It's a good one. They're really great movies. Very scary to watch as a parent. I'm sorry. Like I'll have to keep that in mind if I ever have a kid. I can't see it yeah. clearly from that point of view. Well, and I remember enjoying them thoroughly before I had my child. And then now I'm watching, I was like, oh my God, these kids, <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> Ophelia is on her own. Like, where are the grown-ups? Like, yeah. yeah, the only one watching out for Ophelia by some point was Mercedes. Yeah, and I was like, she's, oh my God, what did she do to her dress? <laughs> I was really like freaking out as a mother and then um, oh, she tried helping keep her dress clean because she, she loved really tried her mom. yeah she really she tried <laughs> And then the mom thing kicked in, like, she just took a bath and she's going to go down in that tree. Like, are you <laughs> kidding me? Like, I was, I was sitting there like, she just took a bath. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And then in the orphanage, I felt that mom's grief. I cried a couple times. I felt so bad for her. So it was definitely must watch. And if you're a parent, don't watch it. I don't know. Like, (laughs) it's just very hard. Take your time watching it. Don't do it back to back like I did. (laughs) Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Take your time watching them. The red light, green light game, though. Really hard to get super bad. Yeah. So I played the red light, green light, but I didn't play the knock one. Yeah, I've never played the knock one. I swear to you, if my child tries (laughs) to play that sucker, (laughs) I already say no to the invisible friend. No, you cannot have an imaginary friend. Sorry. such a normal part of childhood, (laughs) Nope. Nope. I've watched too much horror. No imaginary (laughs) friends. You can't talk to the corner in the wall. No, thank you. (laughs) So I know I've told you this before, but my sister that has a child who's about four and a half, she'll be five soon. My sister overheard her talking to someone in her room and was changing voices for the conversation. And it didn't concern her until she replied, we can't do that. We're too young. And then the other voice, she goes, we have to. (laughs) (laughs) So my sister texted me and she was like, should I be concerned? And I was like, okay, first. First, calm down. Yeah. We need to get some things out of the way first. Has she told you about it? She yeah. Goes, yeah, I know his name. And I was like, has she tried to introduce you before? Yeah. She's like, yeah, she's introduced him to me and Adam and yeah. everybody. And I was like, okay, as long as she feels comfortable introducing you <laughs> to her imaginary friends, it's perfectly safe. That's just her play. If a time comes when she won't introduce you to her imaginary friends, that's a red flag. Yeah, yeah no. No imaginary friends in my house. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Especially after the book we just read by Ellen O. Spirit Hunters. Yeah. That's a good point. I was just like, see, that's why you don't have imaginary friends. Okay, because he did introduce his sister. Mm-hmm. But he never introduced his parents. No. See, I feel like bad spirits don't want to be introduced to parents. Yeah. Because parents are like the level of authority and they don't want to be taken away. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. So just for parents out there, if your child has an imaginary friend, it's fine. It's a normal part of developing no, play. Not. <laughs> it's a normal part of developing play. But if your child ever refuses to mm-hmm. introduce introduce you to their imaginary friend or if they deny having an imaginary friend even though you've seen them yeah. play in such a manner that's a red flag y'all yeah y'all yeah. need to be wary of that just buy them a lot of stuffed animals that cure the imaginary friend thing <laughs> i mean until they start using the animals to be anthropomorphized yeah. and they talk you know what that was more upsetting to me as a kid really yeah, yeah. i once saw my baby sister playing with a kid in the neighborhood at our bubby's place and they were doing that with like you yeah know, the animals and the animals they were projecting through the animals which yeah. i also know is like normal development play but the way that they engaged I don't, there was I don't want to talk about it on the podcast because it's kind of yeah not great and I would have to ask Nadine's permission first yeah that's but, a post-production conversation yes that's a post-production but the things that they were acting out and saying and doing felt like a very negative projection mm-hmm. and it felt like the friend in the neighborhood was actually controlling the environment in a bad way and Ooh. this kid came from a very abusive family mm-hmm. so I was concerned with you know when kids are abused they mm-hmm. project the abuse yeah yeah. Elsewhere. Yeah. And I became concerned that she was projecting the abuse in play with Nadine. Mm-hmm. And I actually broke up their little play date. <laughs> and I sent the friend home. Yeah. I had done the same. Yeah. <laughs> One last note. So when I was watching The Orphanage, I was taken back. So Tomas was the friend with the burlap. Mm-hmm. So that gave me instant trick-or-treat vibes. Oh, I don't know yeah. if you ever seen the movie, right? That's a really good movie. Yeah. And they both released the same year, tw- yeah. 2007. Really? Yeah. So I kept thinking about that. I was like, man, I just love that movie. Yeah. <laughs> Because I know the burlap sack and the orphanage, they kind of panned in the very first scene to mm-hmm. the scarecrow. And in the drawing that Simon did, he looked kind of like a scarecrow child. Yeah. What if the scarecrow has anything that we should have looked into? You know, I was thinking about that too. I was like, maybe there's a significance there. And now thinking about it, it's Guillermo del Toro, so there has yeah, to be some significance. Is. Yeah. I just didn't think about it. If y'all know, let us know. Let us know, yeah. <laughs> I think that was really it. Although I did in the very beginning start writing down notes that other orphan children are mean. I kind of felt like they had no reason to tell Simon that he was sick and he was going to die young. I felt that was mean. And I felt like that kind of maybe put a crueler light on what they did to Tomas. Well, and even to tell him that that wasn't his real mom and dad too. That's kind of a mean thing to say. Although I feel like that was probably less out of cruelty and more like, well, we're orphans. We also, we're not going to have like, like you're like us. 
You're like us. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I don't Maybe think, that was a trust building thing that they did. I don't think that part was cool. But the death thing where it was like, well, we died young. You're yeah. going to die young. And we have proof because you're sick. That was kind of mean. That was mean. Because they also picked on the kid with the physical deformity. Which his physical deformity was not bad. So, no, like, not at mom, all. Like hiding him and putting a burlap sack over his face was just, that was a personal problem on her. End. Yeah. I mean, that showed definite non-acceptance from mom. And she was super young too. Yeah. When she had him. It made me wonder like how she came to be pregnant with him and maybe that was more of a projection of how she treated him oh that could be it oh now i want that backstory right man i hope you guys enjoyed this episode we'll see you next episode for guillermo del toro's love stories yeah which i'm really excited because it took this podcast to make me watch shape of water because i wasn't gonna watch it oh see i saw crimson peak in the theater with am and rena yeah and everybody back in boston because i remember going with them yeah we'd gone to see pride prejudice and zombies and then (laughs) and then the next thing we saw was crimson peak and yeah i was like man this group is like so much because i'm a romantic i was like i'm not the type to go actively watch romance movies yeah. in any respect and i think that may be why they were able to successfully drag me to pride prejudice and zombies yeah <laughs> and crimson peak yeah crimson peak may be my favorite romance movie ever oh you know what when i rewatch it i'm gonna keep you in mind and see what i think you might have liked out of it i will give you a clue one of the reasons why i think i liked crimson peak is one of my favorite romantic songs uh-huh. is Dearly Departed by Shaky Graves. And I think that it's just so romantic. Yeah. Even though y'all are going to listen to that song and be like, Sydney, there's something like inherently <laughs> wrong with you. <laughs> and I am quite aware. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we know what we are. <laughs> yeah. As someone who's aromantic, I'm well aware of my reinterpretation of romantic imagery. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited to watch it because it's been a while since I've watched it. So it's going to be almost like a brand new watch. Nice. So I'm excited. Yeah, we hope you guys are looking forward to that. Also, before we end, I want to just kind of plug our social media a little bit because mm. we've been doing some fun things on Instagram, on our stories, on Tuesdays and Thursdays and alternating. We do terrifying Tuesdays where we just bring you something terrifying the sky's the limit with what we put out there but then on thursdays those are a lot of fun by the way yeah thank you for doing the stories because i have no (laughs) ability to do those yet (laughs) eventually i'll learn you um, yeah and on thursdays we do this or that where we give you like some choices and then we share our choices and we welcome you to share your choices and of course tag us anytime you listen yeah you hear that jerry tag us quit just texting me your responses yeah i I appreciate it but we would like some back and forth too. yeah and we'll happily share i just wanted to give that little quick plug because we do kind of work hard on it it's fun and by we she means her ah. <laughs> <laughs> i think that you did mine for me last yeah, time I I was in a meeting. <laughs> so just one other thing about songs that i realize are odd that i find <laughs> romantic but when i listen to them i'm just like so enamored with how romantic it sounds there's a song called fine shrine by purity ring and the lyrics are get a little closer let fold cut open my sternum and pull my little ribs around you the lungs of me be crowns over you and i was like that is so sweet <laughs> We're going to we're going to talk about this because like okay guys, I love The Weeknd. I stand for him so hard. And I told Sadina when he first it was introduced to me, it was as a horror R&B artist. And his songs are listen, if he came and told me some of these things in person, I'd slap him across his <laughs> face. But if he sang them to me, for sure, let's do some of these things. We're going to talk about this in an episode. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. And with that, you guys can decide if you'll ever listen to me talk about horror ever again. You love us. You know it. (laughs) Bye. Bye. If you liked listening to us ramble on about horror, subscribe to our podcast and tell your friends. And if you would like to follow us on social media, you can find us on Instagram or Facebook at LLOTL Podcast. Check out our website by going to lastlibraryontheleft.com. Be sure to visit our About Us page to discover our two truths and a lie. Or if you'd like to send us an email, you can reach us at somethingwicked at lastlibraryontheleft.com.